Ruben, well, Ruben and I were talking the other day about this, you know, topics. And this one came up as, as something that was interesting. So um, I suppose let's, let's, let's frame the conversation, Ruben, in terms of what we mean when we're, we talk about working on the reception phase. Um, well, first of all, I would like to say hello to everybody. I'm very happy to share this time with you. I hope that I can make you all happy afterwards. Um, and I think that it's important for me to uh, start speaking a little bit how to organize in general a team. And of course, since the, the game starts from the server and reception, I think that the, the reception is a critical point and how to organize the system of attack around this reception, I think this is the most important part of the game. I think it's a more or less almost, I don't know, it's like a 60% of our points are scored after the, the side out. Yeah. Uh, and it comes after a reception. Am I, am I right, uh, Mark, about the numbers? Just correct me. Eh? Uh, it's closer to 67, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and the thing is that the, this is a critical point at the moment we start coaching a team. Uh, I think that for me along the years, to make everything clear for myself, first of all, um, in order that we can somehow coach a team, we have to create a system at the moment we design a training plan. Yeah. Um, so I think this is the, the best, the, the first step. We have to create a system which contains the side out system, the breakpoint system, but we need first of all to create a system. Once we create a system that everybody can create their own system, once we have a system, in my eyes, we should go to a method how to develop the system, how to coach the system, how to improve the players. And one thing that I can speak uh, from my experience is that because volleyball is a unique sport, everybody knows, yeah? Um, Mark is working uh, in a really interesting project about the interactions. I think the, the interactions like any other sport, it's critical at the moment we develop the method, the system, or the system, the method. Uh, I think this is the, the, the biggest point and the most important point for me at the moment to start developing a team. And it doesn't matter the level you are coaching, uh, a system, you have to create a system to work since mini volleyball until high performance teams. Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts, Mark? Uh, I can only agree with Ruben until now. <laughs> Bravo, Mark. <laughs> you know, uh, keeping Mark at least in a somehow agreement point, I would be absolutely happy, you know. Um, yeah, but that would be boring. No, no, no. No, there, there's going to be some arguments, for sure. Um, I think, guys, that... Um, because along this, I'm coaching, I can say, professionally since 1993. I have done all the way since, or from mini volleyball until, I would say, high performance uh, in different, many different countries, in many different languages. Um, and I think one... One important point I would like to highlight is that the importance beside the system to create a team because it is repeated. Everybody knows how important is a team, but as soon as you can keep a good system of working, for sure that the team development will be faster and people who are in high performance, I think we know how important is that the team every weekend performance 
the performance is good to keep our jobs. This is the one, one, one thing, and as well as keep developing the, the players because I think everybody is happier when we win and it's easier to improve the players when we are in a winning uh, pattern. Yeah. So I spoke a lot about the system, how to start developing a system. And this is also a question for people. How do you think to start to develop a system? Yeah, because in my years, I have started very unorganized. And thanks of our volleyball school that this kind of coffee we have right now, we have the bliss in, in Argentina to have many opportunities to share small conversations with many different coaches. And I think we enjoy the mentoring of our colleagues. Yeah, I can mention many, many guys, not only the most famous, such as Julio Velasco, Daniel Castellani, Marcelo Mendes, Raul Lozano, and, and many others that I'm, I forget right now. Uh, but also I can start from the bottom up People like Fito Quiroz, Chefa Palacios, Gege Combes, people who were always sharing their know-how on our benefit, the younger coaches. So, and that's, that's why it's amazing for me to have this possibility. So in this, in this moment, when I started very unorganized, uh, I was doing a lot of things in, a, in many different ways until... Uh, I had the kind of revelation how to to organize a system. And this comes from many of the, the bigger coaches in Argentina. And I had the possibility to learn from them and, let's say, profit from their own mistakes, from their mistakes, not to repeat more mistakes. And, of course, every day I'm making a lot of errors. Yeah? Uh, so at the moment to, to develop a, a system, I would say we should have a kind of performance picture. In Spanish we say modelo técnico, I think in Italian it's somehow the same, uh, but the kind, kind of performance picture. And from where this performance picture comes, I think it is from the really high level players. Yeah. Um, just, uh, John, make me stop whenever you want. Eh? <laughs> uh, I think that I used to speak a lot with the players I'm coaching or the players we are working together all the time uh, and also with some colleagues that when I have a doubt, I don't have any problem to ask my big volleyball Bible is all the time that the volley help us looking for what are the best players all over the world doing. Of course, it's completely proven that from a picture or from an image, it's easier to learn. And it is, it is a lot easier for us to coach nowadays when we can show players what the best players in the world are doing. Of course, keeping the attention or keeping the difference that a kid of two, 12 years old cannot attack like Leon or Juan Torena or Kubiak or whoever, but it is important for them to start having this kind of role model and kind of example. And for us, as a coaches, is the possibility to learn from the best players of, all over the world. And, and sometimes when we are lucky enough, Mark is a lot more uh, experienced in this topic than me, having the possibility of coaching high-level players, I think it is a constant learning from them every day. And it's challenging us to keep this system flexible 
and this and the methods we have to use to keep them on the improvement uh, way very flexible and uh, we have to be up to date every day and working for the benefit of the players and as well as the benefit of the team. Mark, you want to chime in on that? Uh, no, the, there's a couple of uh, like really good points that, that Ruben made. One is that uh, we uh, the, he just sort of stuck it in the middle there, but about asking people for their um, uh, asking other coaches, people people that you know, people that you might know a little bit for their advice. That's so that's a really um, important part of the, the learning and development process. Um, that, and that was, that was one little note that I made, and then I was going to say something else, but I forgot because I was so caught up in how important that note was. Okay. Well, well I specifically, I, I'm curious your take on uh, learning from the players the and stuff like flexibility that. Flexibility and learning from the players. Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you like me to um, answer or what? No, the, the the that was that was the other point that that uh, that I was going to make a or make a note of, it. and that the, each player the the system there the system has to be there has to be some principles in place, some system, some structure of how to do it. But a lot of it is a lot of it. At least a portion of it will be driven by the individual players that you have and their their skills, not everybody has exactly the same skill set. People can, and in both directions, and not good or bad, it's just people are a little bit different, and you can use uh, those differences to your advantage, and indeed you should and must use those differences to your advantage. Yes. Um, I think that, of course... That's, uh, uh, you guys didn't get any of that, did you? No, no, we got it. We got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard. I think, the, uh, I think Mark, I, I agree that uh, depending on the, on the quality of the players we are coaching every season is the possibility that we can, uh, let's say, squeeze the system as, as much as possible. Uh, but also for me, uh, the permanent challenge is that since I'm working with such a system, I can also help the players to improve the level. And I think you know, because we've been playing a lot against, and uh, I think that I was able or I'm able always to develop pretty consistent teams in any competition regardless the kind of budget we have mm -hmm. and and this is uh, the um, let's say without telling anything wrong or not to being uh, misunderstood, misunderstood it's a kind of I would say success I'm happy to to have because since I'm abroad of Argentina, I won only one title. There is a, a tournament in, uh, among the northern countries in Finland. Uh, but I have taken a medal in each country I was coaching. And this is not to show, oh, because no, but it is giving me the feedback that the, the system I'm working with somehow helps the players to have success. And, and I think one, one very important thing that I think I have changed a lot since I started is to be more and more focused that the most important thing we are having every day are our players. Yeah? Um, and this is also a thing that we need to really take care of them on trying to bring them better 
every day. And this is our challenge every day as a coaches. Oh, at least, at least from, from my point of view. Um, so, oh, okay, Ruben, let's, yeah. let's <clears throat> bring it back to um, the organization. Yes. Uh, did, so, you know, you, you started off by talking about how you need to organize reception within the context of the, the, the bigger system. So provide a, an example of what you mean by the overall system so that people can get an understanding of, of well, how, the progression. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, the, the organizational or the first point from the organizational point of view is how we will set up the reception line. Yeah, this is the, 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 first, the first thing how, how we can organize and it is based on the, on the, or will be the basement of all the construction. Yeah, um, since we know that the game starts from the service, At least every day, every single day, I would say 70-80% of the things we are doing in our trainings are starting from service and reception. Yeah? From service and reception, then once the players have a basic skill to be able to play service and reception, we should establish a system how to play the reception line. Then we can say, with jump service and float service, we should divide. Uh, with jump service, of course, three people is the most common system all over the world. Yeah? Uh, with three people, the two, three fundamentals are that we cover the core of the, of the field. So we are taking the, the center of the field with the reception. Um, all kind of short services or in three meters line should be managed middle blockers, especially now with the, the power of the, of the service, middle blockers should be really, really uh, aware of helping on balls which are touching the net, some short services, and even though when the opposite is in front, in set one, in set five, they can also sometimes, against certain servers, help, because what we have to keep aware everybody that the first ball is the most precious thing that we have to keep alive to bring the game up, yeah? Um, with the float service, I have changed a lot. I started with always three players, sometimes with two plus one. And this year, I think we found out a pretty interesting lineup where we have always with the outsider who was away from the setter, when he was back, we made him free to attack the, the pipe and we pass float service with two players. And when this player was front, we were giving just like a two plus one, a small part of the field because he's a good attacker and not, not because he cannot receive good, but we were relieving him for the, for the, for the attack inside out, who he was also a very important attacker in the side out system overall. Um, but once again, we can play with five, we can play with four, we can play. So this is up to the level we have and the skill of the players we have. Yeah. So this is always in relationship with the skill the players we have. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that this is also important from our point of view as a coach is that as soon as we can really uh, detect or as soon as we can really realize which kind of players is also 
what we can play after in attack. Did I answer um, the, the, the point? Uh, yeah, you're getting there. Mark, what, you, you were going to say something? The, the, the first thing that, uh, or that I want to add to that is that um, uh, you, you want to, and Ruben is, is going around this, this point a little bit, is that you want to have a, a structure, a system in play but you can't afford to be uh, you can't afford to be locked into one one way of exactly doing things. So Ruben makes the example here. He had a player who was had a particular set of skills, and so he adapted his little system. Uh, little system. Sorry, I meant to say it like that. Uh, of protecting the middle of the court, primarily in reception, or primarily. Uh, protecting the middle of the court, but then uh, adapted it a little bit depending on how the players that he had and and the rotations that he had. And yeah. one of the one of the things that that it's easy to for a coach to get caught up in is the idea that there's a system and the people that I have have to fit into the system one way or another, and that more more often than not leads to problems somewhere down the line. So you can, you know, you can get away with something up to a certain degree, but up to a certain level. But um, a lot of the time you leave, uh, you leave opportunities on the table by trying to fit everything, everyone into a box that they might not fit exactly into. Yeah. uh, But then also with the scouting of the teams, um, we often know with which player we need to move one step to the right, one step to the left. Um, also, we have a clear understanding that ball in conflict areas, how to, to work with the sims, with two players, one in front, one in back. I like that player in five, player in one, always are working in front. Player in six is always covering the back. So like, like a wide... A, is a wiper screen, yeah. um, and and then, as I said before, now, and it's even more and more, and it's not only in the top leagues all over the world. The variation of the service it's every day more and more consistent. Um, we were having several conversations among these critical time we are having right now. Uh, We have also the possibility that all of us cannot say no right now to share time to discuss and to talk about volleyball. That sometimes we say, no, we don't have time. Sorry, I call you after. This now is not happening. And people, people who are a little bit maybe not so friendly in this, there is a moment that they are so bored that they start to speak. You know, and so otherwise they, they can only speak with, with Wilson. So I'm better to speak with Ruben, with Mark, with John and somebody else. And, and the thing is that I realized that beside the level of the league, I can see in the higher level, in the medium level, players who can have consistent amount of jam services consistent amount of jump services with a good speed and with a variation. Yeah, where they are cutting balls in 6-1, in, like in position 2-1, or suddenly in the middle of the field. That players that you said, oh, these are like out of this level when we, we are watching games. And I come back to a point where a very old coach in Argentina once told me that from service is perhaps the, the only skill where you can even a game in be, between two, let's say, uh, disbalanced teams. If a team which is serving good, it can push a higher level team and service sometimes is beside the 
the skill. And I know we have to speak about side out, but uh, I also, I will remark when I arrived to Germany almost 10 years ago that Friedrich Hafen, like in very low level leagues, they normally used to choose service instead of side out. Am I wrong, Mark? I I don't remember, but I believe you, and that that was part of uh, f that was part of the philosophy that the coach had, and mm -hmm. it was also a psychological part of that too. So mm -hmm. they had the philosophy that they would surf as hard as they could all the time, uh, more or less, and uh, by choosing to surf first, they. Um, uh, I don't know, they put they they kept that psychological advantage. You you have to actually receive our serve. So um, yeah, I think it's also probably some chance that the that the coach didn't do the maths. Okay, um, yeah, but but I still have players. I still have players who would rather serve first. They would like to serve instead of uh, choosing yeah. side out. Yeah. Um, a surprising so, number, a surprising number of top level players would rather would rather serve first. But is is that an emotional thing that they just want to be able to initiate? Well, or do they not the really understand? <laughs> the opposite of rational is emotional. So yes, it is an emotional thing. Yeah. Or also, it can be that the team feels it's not mathematically the best. But perhaps when you feel strong on your break, break point uh, phase, perhaps players try to choose this. Uh, but anyway, come back to the point. I think well, that I, the, there's, there's, a, there's a question I want to throw at both of you. Okay. So kind of just to, to lead this. When you're looking at your reception phase, the phase itself, What's the first thing you you prioritize in terms of, of structuring it? Is it re the reception itself or is it your attack options? Uh, Mark? Um, I never really split it up, uh, at least in the beginning. So um, I might start with a little bit of reception, but mostly I'll work on it. I'll work on it together. I'll work all parts of it at the same time and then uh, go from there, then look at uh, ways that I can um, uh, tinker with it or improve it or change some elements of it. The, the, when I have a team, when I work together with a team for the first time, they actually coming from a fairly um, head hub, uh, fairly homogeneous background. So men's volleyball, most of the teams do most of the things the same most of the time. And so, you know, when we go into one serve reception position, um, you know, there, there aren't that many variations. So I'll tend to work on it uh, all together, which is actually how I tend to work on work with everything. And then, okay, I want the middles to start here or, we have the principles of reception depending on the opposition scouting. And um, then with this, uh, in this rotation, I wanted to play more of this first tempo. So it's more like that than a building block model. I'm not a building block guy. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think that the the only thing I try to take care of, that it can be more about from the reception point of view is that the best outsider, the best receiving outsider, I would like to keep him close to the setter because then the worst receiver is less times in one or less times in the middle of the field as well. So this is a, somehow a kind of... Um, survival, let's say, a point of view. But 
Then it's a it's a good point. It's a good point. I I do the same thing. Um, so that's the the organization of the or the rotational order, and I normally want to have the best receiver close to the setter for that exact reason. Um, and the other the other rotational one that I tend to do or well, is the my first first thing that I look at is the middle blocker who's the best attacker uh, to be uh, away, not, not close to the setter. So that the best attacking middle is uh, attacking in with the setter in position one, which yeah. is the most difficult rotation. So I want most, I want the yeah. best uh, middle to be in that, uh, yeah. in that rotation. Yeah. The best so, attacking yeah. middle, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And Ruben is, is, is agreeing. And I just yeah. want to insert here a lot of a lot of what you know, kind of the the classic lineup structures in a five-one would be to put your best middle and your best uh, uh, outside next to the setter. Now, what you consider best is normally blocking in or attacking. Um, but obviously, you know, in the men's game, since the back row attack is so strong, you know, your best attacker could be coming from anywhere on the court. So, you know, throw all that stuff out from the old school. Yeah, but, but also I think that when you keep the the close the outsider closer to the setter, uh, he will perhaps attack less in pipe because he's more busy with reception. Uh, but yeah, this is this can be. But also when they develop as a good receivers, they can also really attack like Juan Torrena, for example. Uh, so this is not <laughs> this is not the point. Uh, but I think this is a thing I, I try to to take care uh, And also I think that is, for me, very, very important that all the situations on linking the receiving players must be with game-like situations. It can be three against three, four against four, but... Um, I remember once I spoke with Mark many years ago where he said to me, I always try to work reception that at least there are two players working together. And just to, to keep working the sims, to keep active the communication, and, and I think it's the organization, the organization. I don't want to get caught up into communication. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. And, and I think this is also, yeah, I think it has to be uh, game-like as possible. But, but I really believe uh, that players need repetitions which are also possible in one 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 situation so like with service and passing one more thing i i try to avoid more and more and more is that receiving players are only receiving because also it's not real it has to be that after reception should be somebody but somebody setting at least when we are doing let's say situations where players ask for repetitions. Um, at the weekend, I had, a, I had the possibility to listen to a coaching, uh, this Zoom thing, an, an Italian, and there was Samuele Papi talking, and they, suddenly he was like an attendee, and they asked him suddenly, the organizers, hey, Samu, what do you think? I said, you know, guys, I was asking every day at the beginning every day at the end somebody to serve not so difficult just to add repetitions side one arm the other arm two arms and i think this is also important how much players need and sometimes the players are asking this which can be players want players what, want what? Players want is not the exactly. same as players need. Yes, 
But it's a but it's a, it's an important distinction. Yes, um, I don't care if they if they need. Let's say it's a semantical thing. Maybe as long as they ask for it, okay. is because they need. Sometimes Coaching they need the safe the the safetyness. You know, and I think it doesn't cost much to to give this to the players. And it's not about to keep them happy. It's just no. to keep them uh, self-confidence. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> I can see it in your face. <laughs> no, I said yes, it is. I said yes, it is. It's not to keep them happy. Yes, it is. Well, self-confidence. Be. Self-confidence. Yeah, I yeah. think so. So, so what did... Uh, so Samuel said that... Papi said that he wanted... Uh, that that was important for him to do that every day, or he just said he did it? No, no. He didn't actually say. He said that it was very important for him. Okay. Um, and I, I have the, the, or the experience with several players. Uh, one was, uh, or the last one was asking, like, systematic every day was... I don't want to say the last one because my Hungarian players are all always asking for this. And I would like to, to remark that they were doing a really good season this year. Um, but for example, I think two years ago in, in, in Buell with the Japanese uh, captain of the national team, Masahiro Yanagida, he was every day asking at the, at the end, some extra reps, sometimes line, some, sometimes diagonal, in one, in five. Uh, he was one day asking for some kind of services, the next one. Beside the, the reception training we could do in the morning, but he would like to, to add some contacts at, at the end of the training and working some, some specific things. Um, and I could see during the season how he also got better. So... I would say it helped him. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I think that um, we should we should keep on the develop the developing of the method from the game like situations, using also a lot of synthetic analytic or sometimes also analytical exercises. You know because. I don't know, the, the ones who have the possibility to work with the ball machine, sometimes we don't have players who are constantly serving 120 or we don't have the possibility to have somebody over a table. And I think it's also important for the players to get used for the hard balls, also how to work. Because when I said I like to keep the core, we are also working what to do by keeping the core, if the ball goes to the left or to the right, and we need to use the side or the long side step, it's a lunge. Yeah, lunge. That yeah, lunge. Yes. Yeah, um, that we need to use to keep the ball alive. Yeah. So this is the important to to work, and sometimes we don't have this possibility, and the amount of repetitions that the player can experience only from the game it's limited and i think we can help the players on on this kind of extra reps to work the individual technique um uh, let me ask ruben you talk about you know one of your principles in reception is to defend the middle of the court uh mark i know you have a tendency to shift your your reception based on where the server is facing um, can you talk about the differences? Uh, mm, I don't think there are any actual practical differences. Um, so I move around. I mean, you have to move around depending on the angle that the server's coming from. Um, the, there is a, a tendency if you leave players to their own devices, they'll tend to stand exactly in the middle of their zones. So they will stand, someone will stand exactly in the middle of the court, someone will stand exactly halfway between the middle and the sideline and so on. Um, and you have to work with them in some way to get them to, to 
uh, to change the angles depending on the server. And also the middle of the court is more likely where the ball is going to go than the sidelines. So um, I, I don't say I want to protect the middle of the court, but I do. So it's, you know, the, practically we're talking about the same thing. Okay. Um, we're like almost 45 minutes in. And we haven't actually talked about the offense itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, may, so um, maybe we should we should move on, move forward from reception. But, but you told me that we have time, John. Oh yeah, we do. We do. Yeah, I'm I'm not <laughs> charging any money. So and taking care that in my in my Eastern, I'm Why? giving you time. Use it. <laughs> um, I think this is also important at the moment we play or, or we establish this kind of. Uh, performance picture also it's important for everybody to realize which kind of level we play you know and which is the service that we are going to play against yeah sure. because this is also one uh, conditional thing to push the development of our attack um, All right. I think before, that before you go we go forward we just had a question pop up that I think we, we should get to right now Okay. Um, because it's, it's a bit more tied in with uh, reception, probably. And this one could spark uh, a conversation. How much time uh, do you spend on technique and how much time on game or global exercises? Well, Mark, you first. <laughs> Chicken. Uh, very, very little, nearly all. Um, we... so I do okay so uh, reception I will do in the normal course of practice uh, some simple individual repetitions that will would take up is it for each individual player might be something in the range of 10 to 15 minutes per week uh, and then the rest then uh, I allow I'm fairly liberal in the time that I allow players to choose what they would like to do by themselves. Um, so we have, we tend, I always have free time um, where uh, we, where players can do extra stuff. So there are players that will do that every day. There are some will do it every now and again and so on and so forth. And, but in the main part of training, um, then uh, it's all, it's all global. Like it's all uh, with a score, um, and the more side out that I want to practice, the less extra balls there'll be. So um, that's the I do hardly any serve reception technique. Okay. Um, we normally do two, three times a week morning trainings, more not more than half an hour, and small, very small groups of three or four players, two players. Uh, usually we take one or two of the receivers. Perhaps we take them in two groups, two receivers plus a setter, two receivers plus a setter, and two, three times a week. And then how I structure the training is something like we start with some kind of self reception let's say drills uh, to progress for different six against six uh, games during the training that normally when I have the possibility to have scoutmans in the training, we normally perform our, around 150 to 200 services per training in the normal six against six in, in different things, which normally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, in good, in good. How long do you practice for? Three hours? No, it's about one hour and a half of volleyball, six against six. Yeah. With 150, 200 serves? Yes, I can send you the stats if you want. Uh, you can make up stats. I want to see the video. No, 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 because it's not just to, to show. It's the way uh, there was... Some, we'll have some to see the video. <laughs> we were able to do this. All right. 
then maybe we were training too much. I don't know. I I, I don't know. It just seems I mean, like that, a lot of that sounds like a lot. Uh, I will I will admit that. Yeah. Wait. No, sorry, uh, sorry. I can. Uh, I can no, not, not, uh, not 100. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Not 150 <laughs> services. It was around 100, 120. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, mixed up with the, with the attacks. Yeah, sorry. Okay. All right. So, yeah, okay. It's, you're, you're, it sounds like you're more well, like counting jumps than. Okay. Um, Okay, well, Giannis has a question on opinions on practicing reception from machines and boxes. Brazilian school, a lot from boxes. Uh, USA Karai is never, I would differentiate Karai's on the women's side where you have different considerations at work. Uh, so, but go ahead, fire away. The, uh, I don't think that receiving from a machine is a really valuable exercise. Um, the, the one small area that I, I think that it helps uh, technically is in the preparation of the platform. If you, if you actually receive from a machine, you have to prepare early. Um, so that is that part, but otherwise I, I don't think it has any real value other than players sometimes like it. Um, and I don't really do anything from boxes. So, um, um, yeah, I, I don't do very much reception that's not from a live surf. So uh, I'm definitely not Brazilian school. Um, and if Karch is really only receiving from live, live serves, then I'm, I'm uh, all, in on, all in with Karch. Yeah, uh, for me, I I have no dogmas. Uh, I try to adjust. I try to to read the needs of the team, and I rather like to make sometimes from boxes float services uh, than float services from boxes uh, than than jump services from the boxes or like the the top, top spin. Yeah. The tops, the uh, the spin service from boxes. I I don't like it because also <clears throat> for players are not comfortable, and and I like the ball machine because I think that the preparation of the platform and to deal how to to absorb the the high impact of the ball for me it's important to count with the ball machine uh, because this is also like how we how we will develop because. We were talking about reception, reception, reception. <clears throat> Normally, I wouldn't speak so much about reception uh, because I think everybody agrees that from reception, nobody, absolutely nobody, I don't know a team that from reception won a game. Uh, reception perhaps give us a possibility to attack in a comfortable situation or in a more comfortable situation, but we need to attack. And service and attack are the two skills mainly which are giving us points in a constant or in a consistent matter. For sure, attack is the most important. And once again, from the experience, I can say that Regardless the level of the reception, we need to work. We, as coaches, we need to work on teaching the players and empowering the players to, to take the best decisions possible to make points in attack. And it doesn't matter how the reception is, how the set is. Always we have a principle or I have a principle, and perhaps many have a principle like this, that the last one who touched the ball is the one who can improve the whole situation which happened before. And there is not an excuse to, or an acceptable excuse that the player 
cannot do anything or something with the ball at any level when they are aware of the situation and able to read, program, and execute the best uh, solution possible. Okay, we have more questions. <laughs> the the English the English explanation for that is um, better the ball. So yeah, it's the yeah. concept is that you aim to put your objective is to make every contact better than the one before. Yes, so you, you have no excuse basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and I think the last one who touched the ball is the one who can better the ball always by Killing the ball, I don't care how. Mm -hmm. Re returning or recycling the ball, I don't care how. Yeah. Or at least, or at last, give the ball to the other side to a very uncomfortable situation to the opponent that perhaps we have a better chance to get the ball back. Sure. And... For me, this is a pretty much as an unflexible concept that we have to be very, very, uh, let's say, solid at the moment on the correction of this, on pursuing or fostering this kind of mindset, I would say, uh, which for me is critical. Because at the end of the, the day is the key to win or to lose a game. Okay. Before we get running away too far here, we still have reception questions we have to answer. Okay. <laughs> and actually, uh, just observation for me, it, reception in volleyball reminds me of Catanaccio in, in football in that you cannot, you cannot, as you said, Ruben, reception will not win you, but if you are perfect in reception, you cannot lose. And thus, it becomes counterattack. That's not not true at all. Yes. If you if you side out every single time, why, why would you? Why you. would you say that? Because it's impossible. No, if they no, don't no, get no, break that's points, not they what can't you win. Said. You said reception is perfect. No, I said if you re if your reception is perfect is not no, no, the same no, no, as no. if your side out. Okay. No, no, that's what I meant. Side out. If you side out perfectly, you can't be beaten. Same and as say, in as the same say, as in football. Reception and phase. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you, I mean, you could you could play forever that's, theor that's the theoretically, but yes. The number one note, the number one note that I have on the top of my page, is that reception is not side out. Setting yeah. is not side out, and attack is not side out. Side out is all of those things. So yes. when somebody says volleyball is serve and reception, I don't care if their name is Karch. They're not. I don't care if they want to make a point, they're not being factually correct. Volleyball is actually spiking, which is a whole other point, <laughs> but it's the side-out phase is the combination of those things, and it's also a combination of block and counter-attack and counter-counter-attack and a whole bunch of other things. So making things simplistic doesn't help to understand them or to be better at them. Can I go through these questions really fast? Do you want to? Sure. Because I can go through these questions really fast. Go. Mikhail, what about inviting the server to a specific part of the field by leaving it more open? You want to put your receivers in a place where they will take the most dangerous or the most common serve, or should I say the most common or the most dangerous serve? So, yes, if you are scouting the serve and preparing your reception, you will leave part of the court more open. And uh, so you're not inviting them in a sense, but yes, you are leaving it more open. Okay. Done. About the conflict zones, uh, it does depend on where the serve comes from uh, and uh, it does depend on the server and the scouting uh, and you want to put your receivers in the position where they have the best chance of making a good reception based on the scouting and other information and the, the strength and qualities of your players. Um, I don't know anything about rectangles for players. I talk about angles uh, and which what players are 
uh, taking the uh, different parts of the of the court. And Ruben made a really good point about uh, everybody being involved with reception. Uh, when there's a lot of variation, a lot of possibility for short serves, a lot of possible net tapes, then middles are, have to be, and setters for that matter, have to be an active part of reception. The days of an officer just automatically backing out of court, hopefully, are long behind us because everybody has to be uh, on the uh, involved in that. And... Uh, uh, and the placement of the extra players is part of reception tactics because yeah. it can encourage or discourage players from um, serving in a particular place. So, for example, where a middle blocker is standing uh, can reduce the possibility of a, a short serve and can change the positions that everybody else is in. Yes. And also... Uh, ah, go, go. Sorry. I was going to go to the next question. So, Go. Okay. Um, the reception lineup organization, uh, they should be all roughly the same distance from the receiver, from the server. So the cross-court player should be a little bit in front of the others. In reception, the arm position is, is uh, the most important thing. The hand position is not important at all, and footwork is only important in as much as you can put your arms in the right place. Uh, the arms are the only important thing. That's that's it. Um, footwork. I footwork in reception is something that I never ever talk about, and I spend all of my time uh, talking with receivers about reception, trying to stop them talking, thinking about their feet. I think nothing good comes of making a receiver think about his feet. Okay. Um, Ruben, do you want to respond to any of that? We can leave that. that, that no, I think that um, uh, about the, the last question I see here, uh, I can see that about the, the footwork, we can perhaps tell or talk about footwork, the, the launch step, in case of saving a ball to the line, interacting in the in the seams, uh, but for example, looking after some videos I was watching while I was preparing a little bit the the topics and the the things to speak, and oh, we really scout good this season, but we didn't have big issues with hard jump services in the seams that we we were able to, or we were on the need to work in this kind of one in front, one in back. Um, I remember some years back in Germany, we were working a lot with our libero on crossing in front, for example, from one crossing in front of the player in six to take this ball and working also a little bit to take, take care of the, the sideline. Uh, but I think when the positioning of the players is okay, we need a little step, but it's not something that we can really, let's say, talk a lot. And in float service, uh, it's maybe, again, opening a little bit the angle, but not much on walking a lot. It's a lot, I would say, a lot on the reading of the ball. And, and then perhaps it's maybe... Uh, I saw Kirai working on this like one, two rhythm, a little one or two steps, but very yeah. step shuffle. adjustment steps. Yeah, so, step shuffle. Yes, yeah, but I, I think this is not a real thing that we have to, to pay a lot attention when we are stressing or playing a lot from two against two to six against six. Uh, and, and as less amount of time coaches have for practicing, I would say more we should go straight away, no warm-up, no nothing, on 2-2 two and two, two, or even 1-1 one, one to 6-6, six, six, the one hour and a half or two hours training. Because this, I would say, it's, a, it's also a kind of, 
uh, and I know I'm going away from the, the topic, but uh, I think it's important to remark we should make the time as productive as possible in the training. And this mo model of coaching our ball sports like individual sports should be in a way eradicated. But yeah, I don't know, there are some, some places where some people still working on it thinking that uh, the technique will be trans transferred after for, for this. Okay. All right. That cleared up the reception said, questions. <laughs> on uh, ahead, on catch, just on catch, that one, that one, two thing, I've just been watching videos of catch playing. And I can tell you that catch never did that one, two shuffle in his whole life as a player. <laughs> no, but for example, I had things of corona, coronavirus, the possibility to speak with of one of my biggest mentors, with Daniel Castellani, and, and he said often, you know, guys, when I was playing, the service was coming like this. I could smoke the whole cigar before I play a reception. And, and somehow, I think this has changed oh. a lot. The yes, speed. touch passed everything off one leg. Off, so even yeah. off that, even off that uh, really slow surf, he couldn't manage the one two. He was he was <laughs> running sideways and passing off one yeah. leg. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, one important thing also that I would like to remark with the reception is that beside the the amount of persons, beside the system we play. One thing should be no negotiable is the height of our outcome. Did I say right, Mark? So how yeah, loop, yeah, how loopy, how high is the ball we are bringing? As higher yeah. the ball is, absolutely everybody will have more time to develop the most precious thing after keeping the ball alive, which is attacking. When the ball is loopy enough, we will have the setter. It doesn't matter if the ball will be in three or away from the set or from the net, to have the time to decide what to do, not to run after a problem. Yeah? So the one of yes. the things uh, yeah, I would like to say that we should avoid a point, we should avoid an overpass, we should go up. Yeah? And with strong services, yes. keeping the ball in three meters, then the ball will land inside the, the three meters area smooth. Go ahead, Mark. No, no, that's it. Okay. I was agreeing. All right. Okay, very good. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about the attack. I mean, Ruben, you've already kind of started us off by talking about first you, you go for the kill, second you go for recycle, third you go to put the other team in difficulty. Mm -hmm. You guys want to expand upon that? If we have time, why not? We can um, talk for as long as you like. I think that um, it would be very important, or at least when we... When we decide how to work with the attack, we need to, to see or we need to analyze how to prepare the attack based on how the reception is. And how the study we do around the game, and once again, doesn't matter the level, yeah? As lower the level is, most probably, as many more possibilities that the ball will be in the middle of the field or outside three meters. So, which means that setters are going to play with a lot of ugly balls. So one important thing at the moment we, we practice and we 
program the trainings is to keep this in attention that when we add extra second, third balls or wherever that we want to add all the time to add volume in the trainings is that we need to highlight and we need to remark that almost six times out of ten the balls are in the three meters line or outside the three meters line. Yeah? In any kind of national league level we can say russia poland or italy or in hungary or in austria or in finland or wherever the the rate is almost more or less the same yeah and with i heard also with the new ball the importance of the jump service is getting even higher so the amount of balls which are in three meters line and outside three meters line is more and more. Yeah. Um, what I think it's also important, the quality of the setter touch. Yeah. Because when the ball is close to the net, the biggest possibility for the setter to break the block is with the touch. How fast is the release of the ball? As fast as the release is, the middle blocker will have less pro uh, more problems to, to read the set. Yeah? Or to react and arrive to the, to the point. Yeah? So I think this, the precision, the height of the contact, and the speed of the release, for me, are three critical points to evaluate the setter. Uh, and this sometimes, let's say, divides the quality of the setter. <clears throat> After, when the ball is out of the net, I think it's very important how we locate the set and how precise, around three meters line, how precise is the setter and how much we work on the precision of the setter in these kind of balls, like keeping the ball one meter in, one meter away from the net, more or less, that the ball is always playable. Um, and I think it's important, the speed, the height, and if the attacker has always the possibility to attack the line. That, I would say, the first quality when the ball is in exclamation or in open ball that I, I like to, to call it uh, because it will, it will bring the, the attacker the most possibilities to attack with a good range of, of points. Mark, you want to expand on that or anything? Uh, I'm not sure if Ruben was going to come around to this, but one thing that I'll add in the in that whole uh, phase, if you will, is um, about the setter on pretty good reception. Um, with it's the height and and speed of the contact are important, but a really important part of the system of side out is uh, is managing the middles managing the first tempo, uh, how you use the first tempo, uh, which, where they run along the net, um, how they, the, the types of balls they hit, and because side out is the combination of all things, and what the setter then does after that. Can everybody read it? <laughs> yeah. I normally present to the team uh, this thing and I like to remark the importance of the middle blocker in the attack system because it is very important to develop the whole structure of the attack and often middle blockers are always, um, how to call it, 
I don't exactly know the word, but often people say, no, middle blocker cannot do this, middle blocker cannot do that. Respect that. And a middle blocker, a bad, no, let's say in another way. I have a maxima, like a good middle blocker will never make you champion, perhaps. But the bad middle blocker for sure will win a team. So for me, the, I really enjoy working with the middle blockers. Even if I'm 178, one of the, the most pleasant uh, things I have as a coach is working with the middle blockers. From blocking, from attacking, but mainly from attacking, because I also feel that this is a, a very important topic, assigning them as the most important player in the attacking system. Because as Mark said, how the setter would manage the middle attack, it's very important. When to give the middle attacker balls, I think one situation that I think it's very important that the, the middle blocker plays a lot is when the reception is in three in the middle of the field, because normally they have all the field to attack. And it's also very difficult in good ball that the position four will help and perhaps will help once, but if the setter is clever, the next one will play with the opposite and it will be straight away a hard ball. Uh, and I think that also using the middle as a trap to the opponent middle blocker, I think it is very critical. This And so I think everybody read in red that I, I wrote that, that the middle for me is the, the most important. Anything to, to add, Mark? Or no? Nope. All right, the, the thing that I would throw in there, um, and maybe this audience um, doesn't reflect it, but maybe somebody who's listening on later on is, one of my major frustrations watching coaches of say high school or juniors or something in that level is the coach, when I ask them, why aren't you, say, running a quick element in your offense? It's because we don't pass well enough, which drives me up a wall because there's, there's, there's a correlation between those two things. Uh, if you actually are going to try to incorporate the, the middle in your offense, the quick in your offense, then, okay, obviously there needs to be an element of, of good reception. But if you don't, there's never a, a specific need for it. Because if all you're going to do is high ball or even tempo balls to the pins, your setter can be off the net, away from the middle of the court. It's not, a, it's not an issue. So working on developing that, that quick attack with your middles actually encourages the team to have a reason to actually pass better than they would necessarily otherwise. So it feeds to their, their motivation. Plus they love it when they get a kill. The, Professional and national team players love it when they get a quick attack kill. I remember uh, being at the, the Final Four, the Champions League Final Four in Berlin in 2015, and Zenit had subbed in the young Russian setter, who's now their, their, the national team starter. Um, they would taken out Maruf, and the first time he got a kill off a middle attack, he went running all over the court. I think he did it every single time they got a middle kill. So it's still an exciting part of the, of the, the game for the players, and if, if coaches don't encourage them to to push themselves in that way then you stall out you know a huge function of their of their development um in that regard uh, so as a teaching as a as a teaching point that if you make the target really big people will hit the target 50 percent of the time and miss the target 50 percent of the time and that number those numbers don't change very much as you make the target smaller Okay, this, so that, you're basically are touching on something that I wanted to bring up, which is gold medal squared, and their philosophy just, on... That's actually, where, the time, that's actually the point that you just made, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, and I know both of you guys have the, the GMS manual. Um, 
and you've both gone through it to a certain too. degree and and have you have two well you've got an older one don't you um mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on on their teachings i've got an inkling but let, let's have the audience get a sense of it who wants to go first i can i think that um for me it is as many other volleyball staff some sides inspirational, some sides not. As I said, uh, I had the possibility to speak with some people outside the sport, and sometimes I would separate the academics and the corporational business, you know? I would say in academics, you can be a scientist all your lives. You get paid by somebody to make some researches. You bring results every now and then. But I'm sorry, on Saturday, when we play, we are at the corporational side where we have to sell and show performance. And sometimes science and performance are not exactly hand to hand. We can get out of the science a lot, but it cannot be a dogma. I think the biggest problem in planet Earth is about dogmas, guys. Maybe it's too philosophical, but I would say I'm really pragmatic. I would like to take the things which I believe bring solutions as fast as possible to this team. And what this team needs, perhaps, is not the need of tomorrow's team. And as the same as the system. We need to create and develop a system, but doesn't mean I don't remember who of you two write once an article that I have coached this season several years. Oh, that's, I... a, that's that's a that's a that was from my uh, my volleyball coaching wizards interview with Todd Maddox, who was talking about there are coaches out there who coached the same season thirty years in a row. And I think the solutions we need for this team and the the performance picture of this season perhaps is not going to be exactly the same next season because if the evolution of of the service keeps it up most probably we will perhaps need in one year to add by default one more person in reception i don't know i'm not saying so but we cannot attach to this system because it's successful for me the system has to be dynamic and flexible, and we as a coaches, we need to keep in this learning process every day to, to get better, you know? Yep. Mark, you want to take it? The, uh, John's, uh, John's question about gold medal squared, uh, I really like gold medal squared because it is uh, based on some sound principles, which is, of course, what their objective is. Um, It's based on sound principles. It follows a really good, uh, consistent logic from start to finish, and it provides... So I I really like that part of it. Um, The fact that it is uh, literally, in many cases, a recipe for how to work makes it particularly attractive. Um, but I don't accept their their initial premise, which is that there's one way to do something. Exactly. But they Basically, have chosen I... one way and they followed those principles um, consistently to provide a recipe, And but what they do is one way and the lesson from, is only one way. The lesson from Gold Medal Squared is that follow specific principles, follow a consistent logic, and make a recipe. Um, 
So that's the um, that's that part. My gold medal squared team. The what Ruben said about um, scientists and coaches is that a performance performance coaches lead science. Science by nature, especially sports science, is um, uh, takes time. It is also very difficult to conduct because uh, science on high performance subjects is well. There are very few high performance subjects by definition, and mm -hmm. so the science the science in this context is not very easy to come across. Coaches, good coaches at least, are scientists in that they're conducting scientific experiments, uh, testing testing theories with a result, making um, conclusions and moving on one way or another for that. Coaches, high-performance coaches, uh, lead science in the performance field. Of that, I'm sure. Okay. Um, the thing that I would toss in about GMS is, a, a, I won't say a lot, but some of the principles that they apply, for example, where you should pass the ball, how far off the net you should set a ball, some things like that, uh, for me are applicable in a general case with regards to competition. They're conservative, so they're, they're very biased toward error reduction in a lot of ways, um, which I don't necessarily go along with. And I know, Mark, you definitely don't like talking about errors. Um, and for me, from, from a from for me from a developmental perspective, it goes back to the limitation thing. Why should I be training my players to pass the ball near the three meter line if I can train them to be more precise? You know, that's just personal from that regard. Well, uh, but I don't know exactly what do you mean by errors, but our sport is an error sport no it is they they they're they focused like in reception you know they want you to pass eight feet off the net two meters off the net to avoid an overpass yes so that's that's the whole reason for it it's not because you can run your offense better in that regard it's to avoid errors what they don't seem to account for is whether or not being able to pass closer or further off influences your breakpoint ratio, your side out percentage, you know, taking into account that, okay, maybe you occasionally have more overpasses. Yeah, but just answering 323-566 on uh -oh. problem solving, uh, I think that the game itself or the point of view of the game I have, and I think many of us have the, or share maybe the idea is that since it's a ball sport played in a team, the thing is that we are constantly on problem-solving situations. Yeah? We have to assemble a puzzle that the, the pieces are falling apart every second ball. You know? It's... It's a puzzle that we need to put together, and as soon as we put it together, we need a new one, a new, a new one, and it's every different one in a different shape. And I think this is the most important. I said, I know, I said many times, most important. Uh, but it is, it is, uh, I think, a critical point on the way we create the system, we found the method, and work with the players on this problem solving situation because problem solving it's about what the player did to make the point in interaction one to each other right as simple as it sounds as difficult as it is sure. anything mark <laughs> All the all of the all of volleyball is problem solving, and so I completely agree with um, with Ruben's answer. Um, 
I don't agree with the with the wording in the question because the there are no players on TV who are not technically good, and the idea that Igonu for or Boscovich, I don't know the general, but I know Igonu and Boscovich to say that they are not technically good is really really strange idea to me because you're talking about the two best players in the world and okay two of the best four whatever then to say that they are not technically good is is really strange i I don't even understand the context of the question what i think it means is that the players who are physically outstanding or physically dominant are somehow supposed to play in a different way so I work with a player who was who could touch three meters eighty on a spike attack, and he spent his whole time, his whole life, looking for the block. He was trying to spike past the block because all of his coaches told him that this is what spikers have to do. They have to see the block and spike past the block into the play, empty space in the court. And he could never do this because there was one simple reason that he could not do it. He was over. He couldn't see, he couldn't see the block because he was here and the block was somewhere out of his view. So every day he was trying to be a technical player and he, every day he was making himself a worse player by trying to do something that was for him impossible and made him worse. He is a much better player when, and now he was this season, he was the top scorer in the Russian league. Maybe he can't see the block in the Russian league, but the, the, this idea that players are not technical or they don't have some skills, this is, you see this, uh, you can see Zorzi talking about players not having technical skills. This is just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. The game is faster. The players are the players are so much better, and to generate the power to to attack at a high point above the net is very high level of technical skill. And Egonu, I watched her play. She spikes every ball over the top of the over the top of the block to and the to the same part of the court. Why should she do something else that would just make her a worse player? So. She is a very high level of technical skill and an excellent problem solver because the best place to spike is where the block is not. And um, so Ruben's answer, problem solving. Yeah. All players have high level of technical skill. Yeah, and also uh, the thing of the problem solving, maybe I'm too, too honest. I don't care how they score the point. As long as we score the point, we have to keep celebrating. We are leading. We are winning. And if the player is happy, most probably the day after the game will come in a better mood to keep, let's say, learning. Uh, but this, this uh, topic, how much technique or how much this, it's like when we get offer of or we get offer players when they and especially they ask me, in a very small budget I have, what do you want, more receiver or more attacker? A guy who can play, guys. I don't care, you know, because then in this kind of money ball mindset, I know perhaps into the system we are working, we can improve the players or we can better the players in some area and some areas not. But at the end of the day, we should extract or we should squeeze the best or as much as possible from each player to bring them better. Sure. All right. Is there, uh, Ruben, so have we not, uh, is there anything we haven't talked about yet on the, the outline you've got working there? I'm sort of embarrassed at how prepared he is. Well, I think that for me, perhaps it's important to, to keep on mind and to maybe to clarify what to do with this big amount of balls which are away from the net. That sometimes is not 
clear for many of us. Uh, and once again, beside the level, I think there are two or three rules that players can get on this problem solving situation. Yeah? Because this read programming and execution process, we can also facilitate the players on taking the decisions. So I think this is uh, also critical because this is the biggest amount of balls the players get. And, and I think for me, uh, we should, as, as I said before, the speed, the height, and the line possibility of attack brings a clear overview that, for example, we normally try to talk with the players that we shouldn't get blocked by the middle blocker if the ball is well placed. If the ball is badly placed, we should somehow create on the process the players know they are self-conscious when to risk, when to recycle. And it's a part of a really empowering process. Yeah? And under these two, three main topics, we have a lot to give to the players and we have a lot to do with them on the improvement uh, process. Yeah, because most of the times the players are getting on double or triple block, the times they get blocked, it's more on frustration that perhaps in this read programming execution process, they get frustrated, they don't know how to find their right solution or how to solve this problem. And this is all about and for me, it's fascinating at the moment of, of practicing. Um, all right, I've got a question that I'll throw out there. One of the issues that, that we can face, and maybe not at the top level, where the setters are, are more confident and higher quality, but as you move down, is uh, poor, de poor decision-making by the, by the setters in terms of who they set in a situation uh, and, and Mark, you, you, I think, I think you mentioned this the other day in terms of if, a, if the, if an error is made on a quick attack, this, it's the setter's fault. If an error is made on a set to the pin, it's the pin hitter's fault. So how do we work with the setters to, you know, get the right mentality of risk taking in, in a given situation and be favoring the, the set selection that has the highest probability of success? Uh, over and over and over and over and over again. Your watch, and to a degree, nobody, nobody's ever got it, except maybe Lloyd Ball got it when he said that when it was he was asked why he said so many first tempo, and he said that uh, because it's the easiest way to score a point, and nobody. Nobody sets enough first tempo. So nobody's got it yet. Well, Spira actually, I don't know if he's still doing this, but I know that they were intentionally trying to do 35% sets to the middle. Now, I think they were including a pipe yeah. in that, but it's the same principle. No, um, no, 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 but no. I don't it know be, if... It would be, if it was including pipe, it would be, it would be closer to 60 but even 35 is not enough. What, well, I think that was overall. I don't, I don't think it was on perfect perfect pass or, or whatever. I think overall, so but, um, accounting, but yeah. You Basically, you should always set more first tempo. There's no amount of first tempo that's too much. And you can make a whole bunch of arguments about... The, you know, the, the other guys have to be involved with the play because otherwise, you know, they, they, they won't be ready when they have to hit a, a high ball and so on, which are all valid reasons. But basically, you can't set enough first tempo. And they're probably going to get plenty of high balls anyway. <laughs> Any thoughts, Ruben? 
No, I like to, I, I like the setters play quick tempo, uh, but there are certain situations where it's easier to play quick tempo. I think ball in the middle of in position three is the easiest. I think they should play a lot, but also there is a kind of situation that many in high level in these kind of balls, they are jumping in commitment one against one. Uh, I think that the quick tempo clearly close to the setter is more a push than a clear quick tempo. Um, I think we have a pretty much good tradition in Argentina. We play a lot with the middles, even yeah. though the middles are not so huge, but we always work on this also in this problem solving that finding solutions to push the ball, move the ball away from the block and so on. So I think it requires some skills, some skills from the setter. Uh, but also, I agree, the, the middle attack ball normally has a 60, 65% of kill. And why, to, why not to give a guy a ball when he has a 60, 65% of kill and give the ball to the pin when at the pin, sometimes the kill rate is 50-50 or less. So it yep. has somehow yep. a logic. Uh, but yep. then it's a lot about, yeah, the mentality and how they develop. And yeah, I think this is, that's why I like. And also, that's why often setters who can bring the middle blockers involved, especially in transition, the middle blockers, it's a really interesting part of the game. But we are talking about side out. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you both basically made the point of, of why the setters need to be aggressive. The issue is how do we get them to be aggressive? And so, you know, is it just constantly second ball? Give them a second chance to do it again. Uh, is it bonus points? Is it showing them the data? You know, what can we do? with them specifically say, no, we need you to do more of this because we know objectively that's going to be successful, but we're, we're trying to well, overcome their own psychological issues. As I said, you do all of those things and you do it over and over again. And some people, some players will say it a bit more first tempo than others, but they will, nobody will ever say it enough. Okay. Yeah, it's it's controversial. I would say it's controversial, but I I like I like the middles play, uh, and it's it's a very important topic that the players, the opponent team, it's in in fear how the middle can be. Often happens that then when the ball is a little bit away. Nowadays, with such a big guys, ready to block, ready to touch, sometimes we do some mistakes, but yeah. But there's, there's a question that came in um, on this kind of note. If you have a, a, the ball away from the net, so the, the pass away from the net, you want to put the opponent into a problem with a shoot ball or something similar, which position or player would you like to try to attack with that ball? That's I don't understand. I think if, if, you're, if, the, if the pass is away from the net. Yes. And, but you still want to go fast. You still want to go quick. Yeah. Who's the best op option in that situation to receive the quick ball? The one who can play the, the best ball that the setter can <laughs> play. Because, once again, uh, these days, I had the fortune of speaking with a lot of, of the most probably top coaches all over the world. And, and many of them have this coincidence that we need to bring the ball 
to the pins fast, but what does it mean fast? Because fast sometimes means, or no, not means, as a result, fast is a ball in the elbow of the attacker, often outside the antenna, but I play fast. And even though with middle blockers, the plus Liga, in the German Liga, in the Hungarian Liga, it doesn't matter, Russia, Italy, the, the middle blockers make a big step and they are there. And if they are not there full, they reduce the ball. So I would keep working on problem solving in these kind of balls, like speed, but high, and the attacker, the pin attacker has the option of the line. Then as a solution on the attackers, I will work with the block out, the block between, the block out between, the power tip in between the two blockers. Yeah? And these are things we need to encourage the players to make it. I don't know if you agree this, Mark. Uh, I, I, until now, I've never worked with the tip, but, uh, but yeah, I, I agree. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, a lot of, in the men's, men's game at least, uh, a lot of, um, when they, they want speed to the outsides, they actually play the ball that doesn't go to the antenna, so it's not really possible to hit line. So the, t the time between the setter's contact and the spiker's contact is short because it doesn't travel six metres. For example, to position four, it just travels four metres. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's, a, that's, another, that's another way to think about speed. Yeah, but also it's another way to speak about the approach as well, because sometimes the outsider goes too far out when they should go inside the line, in the line, and then being able to hit the line. Yeah, because the evolution of the game and the evolution of the speed of the game perhaps require us, requires us to to change this paradigm, perhaps. And once again, I'm not talking perhaps at the uh, beginner's level, but in any kind of professional league, we have teams, at least my team this year, we can play this, you know? We can go faster and we don't need to go three meters away. It's the same like the the high ball or the, the ball outside three meters or even the long ball, let's say, ball in position two, that when the set is a long side set, I often hear that, no, don't play the long set. Why not? But we have to work this long set. Attacker cannot be three meters outside the field. Yeah? And we need to bring repetitions on the setters that they can play this ball because normally it's a paycheck ball. Yeah? Because it's a one against yeah. one and you can also line with a big line. Even if it's one against one, let's say in commitment, they will have like this, but the, if the attackers Wolek or the lefty from Saxa, what's the name? Uh, Swika. Okay. Yeah, they will push the ball to the middle of your nose. Yeah, and, and I have the possibility to work with our players here because the competition here, the first part of the competition, it's somehow like a friendly preparation, official games. And we were working on this and they, they also found the, the taste on developing these attacks. And, and then you realize that you don't exactly need a super bomba to, to kill all the time. And you can add variation of the game. 
Okay. Anything we haven't talked about? Any more questions from the audience? We've gone through all your bullet points, Ruben. Your yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, yes, I think we we can talk even more, but also I think that the uh, I think it's it's nice to to let them some other people to to let other people speak after us, you know. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts, Mark? Uh, thanks, Ruben. You are welcome. And, uh, thanks, thanks, everybody, for um, for participating. And um, remember Ruben's first point right at the very beginning, which was uh, if you if you get stuck, if you want to find the answer to somebody something, um, ask somebody. Bravo, and. I would like to say one thing before we go, is that <clears throat> I don't want to get feedback of our talk, of somebody particular, but I think for me it's very interesting when I have the possibility to share this, I would like, I don't need a name, I don't need anything, to have an idea what we gave because sometimes also helps me to see what is the interest. In Argentina, we normally say tango, you can only dance by two, and it's the same like coaching. You cannot coach a player who is not interested on some things you want to give, but maybe they are not interested to receive. So this is also for me, Interesting that ask the players, or sometimes at the beginning of the season, I ask often the players what they would like to improve. Because for sure in these points, they will work very hard. And then we can also bring the, the things that we normally see as the weakest points of them and they can work something else. So if somebody wants to write some feedback to John, John, I don't need anything else than the feedback, you know? and if somebody okay. makes it. Uh, so thank you very much, yeah. all of you. I really enjoy talking for me. is nothing really difficult. And, and okay. one more thing, everybody is invited to visit our trainings. Um, I would say I'm very social and I like to learn from everybody. Yeah, and I really, I really appreciate when we have visits and people come and exchange things, point of view, exercises, why this or why not that. All right, Ruben, I'll, I'm going to throw one thing in here. Meanwhile, you can look uh, in the chat at Philip's question and see if you want to answer that. Um, you don't have to. Uh, I will toss in that uh, to reiterate what Mark was talking about earlier about everything being focused on your side out. Um, you may be aware that all of the the analytic stuff, and if you haven't um, listened to or watched the Mark's talk with Ben from I think maybe two weeks ago on analytics, a lot of the analysis you know was based on um, at the end result, the side out percent at the end. Uh, Ruben, you look really confused. Do you not do you not see? Yeah, what I doing? don't. I don't see where is the chat. Go down to the bottom and look for chat. Yeah, but it doesn't pop up anything. Ah, here. On the right. <laughs> there you go. No, yeah, not queuing a chat. Um, just to, to follow up on the analytics stuff, uh, some work that Mark and Ben have been doing of late actually ties in some of the reception stuff, uh, specifically where the setter is taking the ball. Um, so there may be more to come, but definitely go back and, and uh, watch that recording if you haven't yet. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. And remember, I've got a big conversation with some interesting characters on Saturday. So thank you very much. Ciao. Bye. Peace, everyone.